All right, it's 1201. Let's go ahead and get started. So welcome everyone. I'm Ileana Ratu. I'm a clinical associate professor in the College of Health Solutions at ASU, and I'm the current program director of the Masters of Science in Communication Disorders. My own area of interest is in acquired neurogenic disorders, uh, specifically how traumatic brain injury impacts language and higher level cognitive processes. I'm lucky to count Dr. Julie Liss and Dr. Kristen Samuelson as colleagues in the area of speech and hearing science. I'd like to thank you for joining our Health Talks webinar brought to you by the College of Health Solutions at ASU. Our college works to address the challenges facing people and communities to stay healthy, improve their health, and manage chronic disease. These health talks are one way that we serve the community with timely and relevant educational information. Please note, while this series usually offers CEUs, today's webinar is not eligible for continuing education credit. This is applicable to today's session only. And now for a few housekeeping items. First, this session is being recorded and it will be posted on our website, asuhealthtalks.com. That's asuhealthtalks.com. After the panelists have presented, I will moderate a Q&A session. Please submit your questions using the Q&A feature and not the chat box. Finally, you will receive a brief survey asking for your input about today's webinar. We would appreciate your feedback to improve our series. Today's topic is Here and Now, Innovations in Speech and Hearing Science. Joining me today are Julie Liss and Kristen Samuelson. Julie Liss is a professor of speech and hearing science and an associate dean of academic success at the College of Health Solutions. Julie has been conducting NIH-funded research at ASU for nearly three decades. Her work has focused on ways in which changes in speech and language reveal changes in brain health. In collaboration with colleague Dr. Visar Barisha, Julie co-founded a faculty startup company to translate this laboratory research into clinical tools. Julie will be followed by uh, Dr. Kristen Samuelson. Dr. Samuelson received her bachelor's degree in speech language pathology and audiology at Ithaca College in upstate New York. She went on to earn a master's degree in audiology at The Ohio State University, which included an internship at the National Technical Institute for the Deaf in Rochester, New York. Dr. Samuelson later completed her Doctor of Audiology degree at A.T. Still University in Mesa, Arizona. After practicing as a clinical audiologist in private practice and medical settings for many years, Dr. Samuelson joined the ASU speech and hearing faculty and became the audiology clinic director for the on-campus clinic. Her specialties include adult and geriatric diagnostics, hearing aids, and hearing assistive technology. We are so fortunate to have both of these health experts with us today as we explore here and now innovations in speech and hearing science. Deterioration in the ability to communicate has a significant negative effect on quality of life. For this reason, innovations in speech and hearing science can support not just the patients, but also their family, friends, and community. The recent change to allow consumers to buy hearing aids directly from their corner store is having a big impact on hearing health, while advancements in technology are assisting with early diagnoses of disorders such as Alzheimer's and Parkinson's disease with potential future implications for ALS. Thank you for joining us as we dive into modern advancements in speech and hearing science and explore how broader access to technology is changing speech and hearing health. Our first presenter is Dr. Julie Liss discussing speech analytics as a window into neurological health. Thanks, Ileana. First, I'd like to uh, disclose, as Eliana mentioned, uh, I'm a co-founder of a company called Oral Analytics, which is a speech analytics company. And some of the results I'm going to present in this uh, talk today were done in collaboration with uh, some scientists at Oral Analytics. Uh, my work is uh, funded by NIH, NSF, uh, Beringer Ingelheim, and a gift from the uh, JTM Foundation. I want to recognize my collaborators uh, in this work, uh, Dr. Visar Barisha, um, also uh, a number of people from uh, the, the company, it's listed below, and students and, and postdocs who are working in our lab. So we all conduct speech analysis all the time. 
You sound tired. Was it a late night for you? I can tell your allergies are kicking in today. You're so excited. I'm thrilled for you. I get the feeling you don't like my restaurant suggestion. I think you all extract this information all the time. You're, you're making inferences about someone's state of mind or, or, or uh, mood uh, or physical uh, condition based on what someone says and how they say it. And by the same token, you're transmitting that information every time you speak as well. So we become very adept at analyzing the speech signal and the words that we say. Um, and it's not just us, right? It's from the time babies are born, they're, they're listening and analyzing and evaluating and then expressing that themselves. Um, you probably even had experiences with your, your pets where your, your dog uh, seems to know uh, how you're feeling or what you're saying. And the reason for this is that the signal is very rich in what we say and how we say it. Um, we can analyze what we say and how we say it um, through various techniques. In terms of what we say, it's the words we choose and how we assemble those words to convey our thoughts and ideas. And we can use natural language processing, which is a branch of computer science where AI is used to um, leverage the statistical probabilities of language. Um, we can also use acoustic analysis to, uh, to characterize the outward flow of speech, the timing, the pauses, and this gives us a glimpse into cognitive linguistic function and neurological health as well. When we analyze the how we say it, we analyze precision, rate, and rhythm um, with which we articulate the clarity and the melody of our voice as we speak. And um, this gives us a glimpse into the sensory motor speech function in neurological health. But it's not just a glimpse into our mood or uh, how we're feeling on that particular day. Uh, it also offers a window to neurological health. Um, and uh, this is a video, and I, the link at the top is the longer video. These are excerpts from uh, a man who is uh, diagnosed with ALS, and we're going to hear him uh, introduce himself and tell us the date um, at each interval uh, over the course of about a year. And I want you to listen to how his speech changes over time and understand that we have the ability to quantify objectively uh, those types of changes that you're hearing. Um, Carl, would you mind pushing play for me? Hello, Kevin here. It is the 11th of April. Hello, Kevin here. It is... Uh, May 20th, 2012. Hi, uh, Kevin here. It is July the 11th, 2012, and, uh... Hi, it's Kevin. Um, it is November 28th, 2012. Um, it's Kevin again. It is January 25th, 2013. Wait, hold on. Come on, hold on. I mean, I'm not going to run with my name. ALS is a horrible disease. Um, and it's it's heartbreaking to watch that, how fast uh, uh, the deterioration occurred. Um, so as I mentioned, we're able to, to capture, characterize some of those changes. On this slide, uh, I wanna draw your attention first to the top row. This is from a, a, a natural history study that we conducted with uh, Barrow Neurological Institute and a colleague at Harvard. Uh, and this is, uh, articulatory precision on the y-axis, and on the x-axis, it's the number of days since the start of a of this uh, of this natural history trial. So you can see that people started with different levels of articulatory precision. Like the participant one had high articulatory precision, and participant five had very low or poor articulatory precision. 
in each of these cases, you can see a decline over time for all of these patients. In the bottom uh, row, you have another uh, variable, which is the gold standard. Uh, it's the ALS functional rating scale. Um, speech subsystem. And this is the scale that is used uh, as the primary endpoint in many clinical trials for ALS um, when trying to find compounds that can uh, slow halt the uh, progression of the disease. So you'll notice that whereas we see a slope in each of the cases from the speech metrics, uh, we don't see the same sort of pattern from the ALS FRS scores. Um, that is because the ALS FRS scores are collected at uh, fewer points in time, and they're also categorical rather than continuous. So it's on a, a scale from normal speech is a four, and no usable speech is a, a zero. Um, so the uh, fact that you can't really see that progression in the ALS FRS score, which is the primary endpoint in most studies, um, is a real barrier to identifying compounds that actually make a difference. Um, and I'll just add that we've had some uh, success recently in showing that our speech measures in do, indeed do track with, um, with uh, benefits um, in, a, in a, a recent um, study with Massachusetts General Hospital and a number of drug companies. We focused on ALS up until this point, but that's just one use case for uh, speech applications. So if we take a look at this, we can think about it in kind of quadrants. Um, the two rightmost quadrants uh, involve some cognitive linguistic component in their disease. Um, and the two uh, quadrants on the left are more uh, structural, functional, or, or motor related. So ALS falls under the motor speech quadrant, as does Parkinson's and multiple sclerosis and, and a variety of, of other diseases. Uh, when the cognitive component is on top of that, such as in uh, frontotemporal dementia or dementia with Lewy bodies, um, then there is a cognitive and linguistic component. Now, the difference between the rightmost column and, and the leftmost column is that the leftmost column can be characterized strictly by the acoustic signal, so how the speech sounds. The rightmost column is best characterized by both um, how the speech sounds, so the acoustic signal, and also what the person is saying. So this is the landscape in which um, we operate in order to provide insights uh, to the neurological and, and structural functional conditions. So there are challenges that go along with um, uh, speech analytics. First, speech can change for many reasons unrelated to neurological health. So how do we separate the concerning types of changes from the benign types of changes? Second, there are different dialects, accents, and languages, and these require additional metric development and additional validation. And finally, uh, data-driven uh, artificial intelligence methods, which can be useful in other applications, are, are of limited value in speech at this point because of the small clinical data sets that are available for development and testing of the models. But there are potential rewards for getting it right. Uh, remote speech collection on smartphones promotes health equity and access to healthcare. Speech can be collected at frequent intervals without significant burden, improving sensitivity to mild or early changes. Preclinical detection of neurodegenerative diseases is critical for testing therapeutics that are designed to slow or halt the disease. Once the damage is done, it's impossible to, to improve it at this point. Preclinical detection is also the time at which behavioral and lifestyle changes can be the most effective. I think this is where the College of Health Solutions has a sweet spot for making a difference. Thank you so much, and I look forward to questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Liss. So we'll go ahead and uh, answer the Q&A at the end of the talk. So next we have um, Dr. Kristen Samuelson, who will discuss hearing loss and cognitive decline and recent developments in over-the-counter hearing aids. Okay, thank you, Julie, and thank you, Eliana. Now we're gonna switch over and talk about the hearing side of things and speech and hearing science. 
and I never make an assumption about my um, my audience when I talk. I always like to start out with a little human ear anatomy 101 because this you'll see later when I start talking about over-the-counter hearing aids, this becomes very important to know where uh, the hearing loss came from, what part of the ear. So the human ear is split into three sections, really. There's the outer ear, the middle ear, and the inner ear. And in the outer ear, you have your pinna. This is the, uh, the thing that you can see on the outside of your head where we hang our glasses and our earrings. Your ear canal, where, please stop sticking things in there. <laughs> That's my public service announcement. Um, when you put Q-tips and other sharp objects in your ear, you do not clean the wax out. You just push it farther in down here by your eardrum, which is the, the other part of the outer ear. And then the inner ear is an air-filled space with three little bones. We call them the malleus, the incus, and the stapes. A lot of people call them the hammer, the anvil, and the stirrup. And two little muscles and a tube, the eustachian tube, that goes from your middle ear down into the back of your throat that is supposed to open and close when you swallow and when you drive to Flagstaff and when you fly and so forth. And then in the inner ear, we have this snail-shaped object that we call the cochlea. That's your hearing organ. And then we have the semicircular canals, which are your balance organ. And the eighth cranial nerve, if you ever learned the cranial nerves in uh, human anatomy class, the vestibular and auditory uh, signals get sent up through the eighth cranial nerve to the auditory cortex in your brain, which is what really detects, what really um, interprets what you hear. So I, I like to say that you don't hear with your ears, you hear with your brain. Your ear is just a funnel to get get the info there and turned over into a, a neural impulse and sent to the brain. So let's talk about hearing loss 101 now. Um, and this is where the, the anatomy of it will come into play. So there are two basic types of hearing loss. There's sensory neural and there's conductive. A sensory neural loss is a problem in the inner ear that I just showed you, the cochlea, or the auditory nerve or up in the auditory cortex. Conductive, on the other hand, is just a problem with the, uh, the middle ear where sound is somehow not getting through. And so let's see some examples of, well, let's first say that sensory neural loss it makes up about 90% of what we see. And that's important because we have people with misinformation that come in and say, well, I've been told I have a nerve loss. There's nothing you can do about it. This is most of what we treat here is what, you, what people call nerve loss, sensory neural. Some examples of that, presbycusis is a fancy way of saying hearing loss due to aging. Noise exposure is a big one, um, various diseases, measles, mumps, rubella, some of those, um, uh, especially childhood diseases can cause hearing loss. Just genetics, sometimes it runs in a family. Uh, chemotherapy can cause hearing loss. Meniere's disease is, uh, it's a triad of hearing loss, tinnitus, and vertigo that some people have. An acoustic neuroma is a little benign growth that can happen on that eighth cranial nerve. And it can, um, uh, it, it doesn't spread, it's not cancerous, but it can press on other things and cause problems. And then there is a, a case where sudden sensory neural hearing loss happens where people just wake up one morning and can't hear out of one, you know, one ear. And usually the treatments for sensory neural loss are hearing aids, cochlear implants, some kind of assistive device, depending on how severe the loss is. Conductive losses, on the other hand, are problems with, like I said, the sound just transmitting through the ear. And so some examples of that could be as simple as wax that gets impacted against your eardrum when you push the Q, push it down in with the Q-tip. Um, holes in the eardrum, cholesteatoma is a fancy way of saying it's uh, like a little skin ball that grows inside the middle ear and fills up that middle ear space so the bones can't vibrate. Um, you can have fixated or disarticulated bones so the bones can actually get stuck together, calcified together so they don't vibrate or they can get knocked apart. That usually happens in head trauma like a car accident or something. Um, ear infections, that happens a lot in little kids. All those things can cause conductive loss. But the treatment for that is often medical or surgical, sometimes hearing aids if it's chronic, and sometimes a thing called a bone anchor hearing aid, where the hearing aid is actually implanted behind the ear and, and directly stimulates the cochlea. Um, but you can see how it's really important to know what kind of loss you have uh, before you go and try to treat it because the treatments are very different. And then you can have a third kind of um, loss where it's just a mixture of the two. So we call it a mixed loss. That's where like say you have a noise induced loss from working in a noisy factory for many years, but then now you have a wax impaction on top of it, or you have a hole in your eardrum or an ear infection. So that's a mixed loss. Oops, okay, there we go. So let's talk about some hearing loss statistics. About We, we estimate about 40 million Americans have some kind of measurable hearing loss. 
Um, one in three people over age 60. And then this is the one that always kind of surprises people, which is that 65% um, of Americans that have hearing loss are actually under age 65 and nearly half of them are under age 55, which, you know, people always have this stigma idea about hearing loss being a problem of the elderly. And it's actually most Americans with a hearing loss are um, out in the workforce still. There we go. Um, but so all these people, we have 40 million Americans and um, with hearing loss, but only about 20% of them that could actually benefit from hearing aids will actually do something about it. Some of the reasons why um, denial, a lot of people, uh, you know, I tell people when, when you're missing something, how do you know you're missing it until someone points it out? It's usually the person with the hearing loss that's the last to know when everybody's complaining about the um, TV being too loud or, uh, you know, they, they think everybody else is mumbling, that kind of a thing, and uh, just need to have a hearing test and find out if it's your hearing. Vanity, people have been worried about people seeing a hearing aid. I, I've never quite understood that because we think nothing of wearing glasses, but um, I think that's getting better and better. The hearing aids are getting smaller and cooler, and um, the, the younger generation coming up doesn't think anything of seeing big, you know, AirPods and things in their ears, so I think that is getting better, but, and then misinformation, like I said, people come to me and tell me all kinds of stories about why hearing aids aren't gonna work for them, their hearing loss is too bad, or it's not bad enough, or it's unusual, um, or they have nerve loss so they can't use them. And, and a lot, of, there's, there's very few actual hearing losses that we can't treat in some way. Cost is one of them, which I'm gonna talk about over the counter. That's part of what that's trying to address. Um, although like here at the ASU Speech and Hearing Clinic, we take most insurances and there really are a lot of insurances that cover, um, cover hearing aids. And then just accessibility. Some people just, you know, maybe they can't drive or they live in a rural area where they can't get them. And that's another reason why over-the-counter hearing aids might come into play for them. So why does good hearing health care matter? What's the big deal? So let's talk about this. For First of all, um, underlying health conditions. You, when I, I showed you how there's sensory neural loss and there's conductive loss, when I test your hearing, I can tell from the kind of test results what kind of a loss you have and then get you to the proper treatment. But um, you know, a person can have, uh, like I said, acoustic neuromas, you can have a hole in your eardrum. There are all kinds of different uh, conditions you could have, and you'd want to know about that. And that takes an audiologist testing your hearing to figure that out. I'm going to talk about this chart over here in a second. Um, but mental health and overall well-being, there are all kinds of, I could do a whole lecture on the, the um, studies about um, uh, loneliness and with hearing loss and social isolation and paranoia and depression, all of these things happen when people have untreated hearing loss. My slide. There we go. Oh, okay. Oh, let me go back. I went too far. Okay. Um, because here's the important thing is that the that um, untreated hearing loss has been identified as the single most known modifiable risk factor for cognitive decline. So if you look at this um, study or this um, this graphic over here, I know it's really tiny, but I'll kind of um, explain it to you. It was from the Lancet, which is a medical journal, and they're basically showing what risk factors throughout your life you have for dementia. Some of them are not modifiable and some of them are. So at birth, some people just have genetics that, that makes them more susceptible to dementia later on. Nothing you can do about that. Um, early in life, less education has been, uh, it, it's a modifiable risk factor. Um, it's, there's research that shows that the more education you have, the less likely you are to have cognitive decline. But look at here in midlife, here's hearing loss, hypertension, and obesity, all controllable factors and, oh, and the, the size of the bubble shows the percentage. And so the biggest one is hearing loss. And then down here later in life, smoking, depression, which comes from untreated hearing loss, social isolation, also um, linked to untreated hearing loss and so forth. But when you look at the size of the bubbles of all of them, hearing loss is the single most modifiable risk factor for cognitive decline. And uh, a researcher up at CU Boulder, uh, who used to actually do some research here at ASU, Anu Sharma, shows she has some very compelling research, which again, I could do a whole lecture just on that, but she talks about um, how significant areas in the brain change that decode sound, even with really mild losses and even with sudden hearing losses. So I get a lot of people and they'll say, well, I'll wait till my hearing loss gets worse before I do something about it. Or, um, you know, this just happened recently, but all kinds of hearing loss, long-term hearing loss, mild hearing loss, 
recent hearing loss all cause their research shows that causes changes in the brain right away. All right, so I've talked about accessibility and awareness. And so our over-the-counter hearing aids, the answer to this. So I'm gonna talk about some pros and cons. I'll give you a little background on the, the legislation and so forth. Back in 2017, at the recommendation of the President's Council of Advisors on Science and Technology, they called them PCAST, Congress passed a law that it wasn't a law to allow over-the-counter hearing aids. It was just to begin creating regulations for a new category of direct-to-consumer hearing aids. And then it got stalled in COVID. Um, it, so there's a couple of misconceptions that all hearing aids are over-the-counter now. They are not. They're actually only for a very small subset of uh, kind of hearing losses that are out there. But um, audiologists still fit what are called prescription hearing aids. So basically, they created they wanted to create two categories. So the, the goal of this whole thing was to improve accessibility and affordability of hearing aids for, um, you know, to try to try to get at these, uh, untrue, the, the people that aren't being able to do anything about it, the other 80% of people that aren't helping their hearing loss with hearing aids. So fast forward to October, 2021, the new, the new administration in Washington passed the FDA OTC Hearing Aid Act to kind of jump back on what had been started in 2017. The final ruling went into effect on October 17th, 2022, and it gave manufacturers six months to come into compliance with this. And so that gives them till April 2023 to comply with these new over-the-counter rules. So let's talk about the good, sort of the good, the bad, and the ugly of OTC hearing aids. So the good news is that OTC devices are finally regulated. I, I've been an audiologist for many, many years, and people have been, as long as there's been internet, people have been buying hearing aids over the internet, eBay, and all kinds of places. So they're out there, but now there are finally some regulations to help control it. Um, a good thing is, like I said, more awareness to hearing loss. Maybe people will do something sooner, because remember what I just said about cognitive decline. you got to jump on this fast. So remember those 40 million people and only 20% of them do something? Maybe people, you know, if they walk into... Walgreens or CVS and see hearing aids, at least it's getting them thinking about it. It might be a less expensive option. I put a question mark there because like here at ASU, our hearing aids start at $500 a piece and out uh, these over-the-counter ones are, the ones I've been seeing are give or take around $800 to $1,200 a pair, that kind of a thing. They're more accessible for some people. People can order them right on Amazon or you know, go into Walgreens and so forth. And then it, this may provide some options for people with hidden hearing loss, which is a um, kind of a, a new category in audiology where people, their audiogram looks normal, but they still have lots of problems and background noise and so forth. And so we're hoping that it'll be a help for that. And then people that have auditory processing disorders. All right, so of course, along with the good comes the bad. So there's some concerns that we audiologists have about over-the-counter hearing aids. Um, the first thing is that they are only intended for people with mild to moderate loss. But the question is, how does the average person know what kind of hearing loss they have if they don't get tested? And in a second here, I'm gonna show you some audiograms to let you see the variety of hearing losses I see. And that brings up, you know, no two audiograms are the same. And then I say, remember the possible causes because remember I said you can have, um, uh, a hole in your eardrum or just impacted wax. And you don't know about that because no otoscopy. That means nobody's looking in these people's ears. There's no verification of the fitting. Uh, real ear measurement is something that we teach all of our students here at ASU to do in a hearing aid fitting. And it's the gold standard for assuring that you fit that person properly. And obviously these people are getting OTC hearing aids are gonna take them out of a box and just put them in their ears. Um, no hearing healthcare professionals involved at all. They can just go buy them or order them online. And what if you did have a serious, um, a more serious condition? And again, I go back to remember, I talked about the possible causes. This right here is an MRI of a person that has a acoustic neuroma. So you can see that big white, it's like a brain tumor, you know, it's a brain tumor that they needed to have taken care of. But if a person doesn't go and get a proper hearing test to find out what is wrong, you might miss that. Uh, Over-the-counter hearing aids are only intended for 18 and over, but um, they're not going to control that. It's not like cigarettes or alcohol where they're going to ask, you know, proof you for age. They're just, um, it, the FDA decided that was going to be something that they were just going to take a chance on. So people could buy them and put them on their child. Um, hearing aids often, and I would say almost always, require training, oral rehabilitation, maintenance, um, People, you know, we audiologists were, once we fit a person with a hearing aid, um, I always say they're they're part of our family now, like they come in and 
on a regular basis and get them checked out and, and cleaned and we teach them how to use them and so forth. And that's all going to be missing in over-the-counter hearing aids. And their concern is if they don't do the job because they weren't the right ones for them, will people go and go see an audiologist and, and get some hearing aids? Or are they just going to, you know, kind of throw them in a drawer and assume hearing all hearing losses or all hearing aids are bad? All right. So this is just a real quick, I want to show you this. Um, I know it's a kind of a busy slide, but what I did was I just pulled up a bunch of audiograms and I've just done thousands and thousands of audiograms in my career and never seen the same one twice. And um, you can see that these are all different hearing losses without even knowing anything about an audiogram. But basically, the frequencies are across the top, the pitches from low to high, and then loudness getting louder and louder down the side. And the red is the right ear and the blue is the left ear on these. And we just find where the quietest place the person can hear. And so you can see that all of these are completely different audiograms. And yet, all those ones I've starred have a component in there that's mild or moderate. So theoretically, any one of these people could walk into Walgreens or CVS and buy the exact same hearing aids, but would they do the job for all these hearing losses? That's the concern because the prescription hearing aids we fit, we program them. Um, this one down here at the very bottom on the right is a severe or profound loss. This is a person we would call deaf. This is a cochlear implant candidate. And that's the only person, this is the only audiogram here that um, is not um, a candidate for, and, and really, I'm not saying that all these are candidates, but these people might think they are. Like, for instance, this one up here has a middle ear condition going on, so they they really need to go see a doctor. Um, this one has a little part that's mild and moderate, but they also have a very severe to profound loss out here in the really high tones. And uh, here's one where it's what we call asymmetrical. This person could have Meniere's disease or an acoustic neuroma or something. But um, my point is that not all hearing loss is the same, and so the treatment can't be the same for every hearing loss. So I'll just give you a few final thoughts and then we have some time for questions. Um, I say hearing loss is no joke. On a regular basis, when I tell someone that I'm an audiologist, the first thing people go is, huh, what did you say? And like joke about it. <laughs> and so um, I just want people to know that hearing loss is a, is, a, is a serious healthcare condition and it's treatable. And so um, I just want people to take it seriously and realize it's a modifiable risk factor for dementia and needs to be treated early. Think of hearing aids as a medical device, not just consumer electronics. Don't go shopping for hearing aids like you shop for, you know, a new laptop or something. Over-the-counter hearing aids are a good idea if they're used properly. You need to get your hearing tested first and know if you are even a candidate. And then my mantra is always don't shop for hearing aids, shop for an audiologist. Um, even if you think you might want over-the-counter hearing, over hearing aids, come on in and just let us test you and tell you that you're a candidate. And then again, my public service announcement, cotton swabs, just say no. <laughs> All right, and let's see, I've got one more. There it is, thank you for listening. And I'm gonna toss it back to Ileana to field the questions. Thank you so much for both of those wonderful talks, uh, Dr. Ellis and Dr. Samuelson. So I'll go ahead and start um, asking some questions from the Q&A. So uh, Dr. Ellis, I think this first question is for you. Um, any fMRI to determine the distribution of motor or cognitive components in degradation? For example, what causes the decrease in AP? And is it a decrease in firing of signals to the vocal cords as a result of ALS or some mechanical degradation of the vocal cords in response to the signals? That's a great question. Um, so uh, if you think back to that landscape slide that I showed with the different motor disorders and motor and cognitive disorders, the different quadrants. Um, diseases that fall into a quadrant uh, can be measured the same way. Their speech can be measured the same way. And uh, there are characteristics of, of uh, speech that are uh, specific to different types of diseases based on the underlying uh, neurological condition. So in ALS, um, you're right, there's a problem with the, the nerves um, uh, firing up the muscles that activate uh, the, the speech articulators and the vocal folds and so forth. Um, and there are problems in the brain at, at two different levels that we call the upper motor neuron and the lower motor neuron. And so we know from years of, of uh, study what patterns of speech to expect when upper and lower motor neurons um, are, are degenerating. Um, and so articulatory precision is one of those 
features because the muscles that are used to move the articulators um, become weak and, and atrophy and, and they aren't able to, to uh, get to those locations. The other point I'd bring up about this is, you know, we, we think there's all this incredible technology, you know, we just get an fMRI or, or get some, you know, fancy sort of PET scan and we'll be able to diagnose these different diseases. But the fact of the matter is nearly all uh, neurodegenerative diseases, including Alzheimer's and, and uh, Parkinson's disease and ALS, um, are clinical diagnoses. So they have to meet a number of clinical features before they can be diagnosed. There's not like a simple test that will say, yes, you have Alzheimer's or yes, you have ALS. In fact, um, it's common in ALS to uh, not be diagnosed for a year after your symptoms start because a certain amount of degradation has to happen before you know that's what you have. Uh, and Parkinson's disease uh, is, is also uh, misdiagnosed very frequently. And that's a function of the fact that there are many types of Parkinsonisms that look like Parkinson's disease. Uh, and so um, getting a, a right diagnosis is, is really key. Uh, and at this point in time, um, those very early changes could mean multiple different things. Uh, so being able to identify um, other biomarkers that can help inform that diagnosis are uh, really, the, I think, key to, to where we need to go. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, the next question is for you, Dr. Samuelson. So what is the mechanism that could potentially cause hearing loss as the result of undergoing chemotherapy or maybe uh, taking medications associated with chemotherapy and cancer? Yeah, so the thought process there is that um, the drugs in chemotherapy are designed to sort of kill fast growing cells. And what we find is damage to the little fine little hair cells in the cochlea. And so it's one of those ones where you kind of choose the lesser of the evils when you have to have chemotherapy and um, you know, the hearing loss is treatable, but and it doesn't happen to everyone, but in certain kinds of very strong IV chemotherapies, it, it just damages those hair cells. Usually, you know, they're usually not repairable after that. And then um, one of our um, attendees asked that her husband, age 70, was recently um, diagnosed or developed tinnitus and has looked at several medical journals, which suggests that there may be very little that can be done about that. Is that the case? or has there just been not enough research on the topic? It depends on what the tinnitus is coming from and almost always it's coming from uh, hearing loss. And so whenever anyone tells me that they have ringing in their ears or noises in their ears of any sort like that, the first step is to get a hearing test. And if there is hearing loss to treat the hearing loss as the underlying root cause of the tinnitus. Now there are you know, once in a while, I'll see somebody with normal hearing that does still have tinnitus. But I guess the short answer to that is that there are there are actually lots of treatments um, for it. We just need to test the hearing and see if we can figure out where it's um, starting from. Wonderful. And I uh, had another question for Dr. Liss. So you talked about some of your technology with um, tracking changes in speech over time as the disease progresses. But I was wondering, do you think that this technology also has promise for tracking improvements in speech over time with interventions for non-degenerative diseases? Yes, absolutely. Um, the, it's uh, uh, important because right now we really don't have uh, many objective measures for uh, efficacy of interventions. And so um, I think this will be a, a, an important a tool in our toolbox for, for being able to um, verify that, that we've actually made some sort of uh, positive uh, improvement with, with our patients. Wonderful. Uh, another question is, uh, just to confirm, cognitive decline is possibly due to actual physical changes in the brain due to mild hearing loss. Right. Yeah. It's um, like I said, the talking about Dr. Uh, Sharma's study is a whole lecture in and of itself. She uses really kind of a fascinating um, method of giving uh, optical stimuli and then auditory stimuli. And what happens is, um, to make a long story short, when there's hearing loss, the 
parts of the brain that should be being used for hearing light up on imaging um, the, sorry, the, the optical areas, um, the, the auditory areas light up when she gives optical stimuli. And so it's like they're getting taken over and um, there's a whole, you know, a whole bunch of um, uh, results that she connects one to the next and uh, shows that, yeah, that these mild changes when your ear's not being stimulated properly leads directly to, to cognitive decline early on. Yeah. And another question relates to possibly the after effect of surgery. So is it possible that during um, neurosurgery to repair an aneurysm, um, could that possibly lead to any kind of hearing loss? Yeah, I suppose it could. It depends on, of course, where the where the surgery was done, but the cochlea is very, very reliant on the vascular um, source, you know, on the blood source, blood mm -hmm. supply. And so anything, any little, if, if, you know, an aneurysm was being fixed, then if there was any little stoppage of blood flow to the cochlea, depending on where that surgery was being done, um, I would think that that could cause some hearing loss. And again, it would certainly, if a person's experiencing hearing loss after surgery, they definitely should come in and get tested. I think this one is uh, just for all of us. Is there a better way to clean your ears than uh, without <laughs> swabs? <laughs> yeah, ears are designed to be self-cleaning. You're not really supposed to be sticking things in there. And so um, when you're standing in the shower and letting the hot water and the, and the shampoo and so forth run in and out of there, um, that's really all you're supposed to do. You, you probably heard your mom say, you know, don't stick anything smaller than your elbow in your ear. <laughs> That's pretty good advice. Um, don't you just, you can go to CVS or Walgreens and get these little ear wet, you know, drops. They're just glycerin and peroxide that helps kind of soften it. But it's once it gets impacted in there, it's, you really have to go to an ear, nose and throat doctor and have it suctioned out. It's very hard to clean. So I recommend trying to not stick things in there, but if you're the kind of person that has a lot of earwax, just get on a regular basis of seeing a, an ear physician. And for this next question, I think um, kind of applies to both of your talks. Is it possible to apply any kind of hearing aid approach to vocal loss ability in ALS by amplifying neural signals in some sort of implanted device? Very interesting, creative, yeah. creative uh, conversation. Um, uh, unfortunately, the problem with the nerves is that the, they actually stop working. And so it, the muscles aren't getting the activation they need. Um, so there's really uh, nothing to amplify because of the degeneration of the uh, cell bodies in the in the brainstem and in the spinal cord and in the in the uh, cortex. Um, so uh, because they're degenerating, um, I'm not sure of a way to amplify the signal, but that's a, a really uh, creative solution. Um, and then, uh, Dr. Samuelson, you briefly touched on this about um, tinnitus being related to hearing loss. Are there also possible um, neural explanations for tinnitus? Yes, there are um, lots and lots of types of tinnitus and lots and lots of causes of tinnitus. And um, I had a discussion one time with a neurotologist about this, and he said he believes that there, are, there isn't going to be one cure for tinnitus. There will be lots of them over time because it just depends on what's causing it. But, um, you know, I mentioned the, the connection to chemotherapy that can cause when, when those little hair cells start getting damaged, that can cause tinnitus. But there are... Um, structural changes in the auditory cortex that can happen as well that can cause tinnitus. So it just depends on where it is. And I just find that more often than not, it's a symptom of hearing loss. And so if we treat the hearing loss, we usually treat the tinnitus. But yes, there's research being done on that all the time. Thank you. And then um, another individual had asked, uh, her spouse is showing signs of hearing loss, for example, um, turning the TV and other devices at high levels. 
um, but he does not wish to uh, see a physician regarding the potential hearing loss. So what would you suggest in this situation? You know, many of us have probably have a relative <laughs> in a similar situation. Yeah, we can't, we sometimes we kind of joke that it's the TV that's the last straw that brings people in because they just get mad. The other people in the family get mad when the TV is too loud. And there are TV devices that you can get. I mean, even just on Amazon, you know, there's... Um, infrared devices that you can get just to plug in to the TV and then the, the person with the hearing loss just wears a headset and they can adjust it but the TV can be at a normal volume for everybody else in the room. Problem is that only addresses the uh, listening to the TV and if the person really has hearing loss they're probably having problems communicating with the rest of the family too. I, I often tell people it's not a hearing loss it's a communication loss and um, if you you know if you choose not to wear your glasses you're not really affecting anybody unless I guess you go out driving. But if you choose not to wear your hearing aids or treat your hearing loss, you're affecting every single person that tries to talk to you all day long. And so sometimes when you more, we'll do it for everybody else, you know, they'll willing to come in and just uh, at least get tested and find out what's going on for the rest of the family. Very good points. Um, besides uh, medications or chemotherapy, do you know of any over-the-counter medicine that might be um, ototoxic? For example, one uh, individual mentions Tylenol possibly being ototoxic. Are there any um, known studies that have looked at just more common over-the-counter medicines? Pretty much um, the, the medications nowadays that are known to be ototoxic are, have been taken off the market or they're labeled as such very, um, you know, very clearly. Uh, probably the most common um, side effect that we see is not from Tylenol, but, but from aspirin and ibuprofen can cause temporary tinnitus at, at taken at really high levels. Um, but it, that usually ceases as soon as the person stops taking that. Um, and it, it's not really known to cause hearing loss per se. So I'm not, I don't think there's any over-the-counter ones that are commonly used that would cause actual hearing loss. Excellent. Um, and then another individual asks, they have otorosclerosis as well as very mild age-related hearing loss and tinnitus. Um, will over-the-counter hearing aids be of benefit or should they consider some uh, uh, other special devices or perhaps a Baja system? So that would depend on the um, how, um, how much of a loss, how much of a conductive loss there is because otosclerosis can be a really, really mild loss or it can be... Um, pretty severe. But again, I, I just come back to come on in and let us test your hearing because there are also very successful surgeries for otosclerosis too. And so in that case, we might test your hearing and then refer you on to an ear, nose, and throat physician to talk about that as an option as well. And then uh, last question is just uh, someone mentioning that they noticed that their sensitivity, hearing sensitivity has changed as a result of uh, changes in elevation, I believe. Is that uh, a condition of the ear or just what's going on there? So remember I showed you in that, that very first anatomy slide, the eustachian tubes that come from your middle ear to the back of your, to, down into the back of your throat. And it's supposed to open and close when you swallow and you, know, you, can, you can pop your ears and so forth when you drive or fly, you know, drive up in elevation or fly. Um, but probably what's happening is your station tubes probably aren't opening properly and the pressure just builds and builds and builds until you finally get to pop them. But you'll, you'll, your hearing will just diminish a little bit until they finally pop and your middle ear is working properly again. Wonderful. So I think those are all the questions I could find in q and I can give Folks, maybe just another few seconds to see if anyone has any last lingering questions. But we do thank you for your time and your presentation. It gave us a lot to think about. Um, oh, one more just came in. Let's see. Is cognitive decline avoidable um, if hearing is not restored? Is say the beginning of that again. Is cognitive decline avoidable if hearing is not restored? So if someone does not address the hearing issue, can you still kind of? Yeah, like, like you reverse? saw in that in that Lancet um, graphic, there are lots of, of factors um, that go into cognitive decline. So I suppose the flip side of that is true, that even if you did correct a hearing loss, 
you still might have the gene for it or something, it still can happen. Um, but the point there is that if you've got a hearing loss and that is one of the modifiable risk factors, you know, why not treat it and at least take that one off the table? Because it's also got a lot of other benefits too for mental health and, and just overall health taking care of the hearing loss. Very true. And then if you could just very briefly touch on um, balance issues. So are those treatable? And if so, how are they treatable? So that's another sort of another branch of audiology, because as you saw, again, back to that, bringing and taking you back to that anatomy slide in your inner ear, you've got your cochlea and your semicircular canals. And again, there are lots of different causes of um, of balance disorders too, you know, and, and to, to keep your body upright, you've got your semicircular canals and your vision and your somatosensory system, and they all work together. Um, so we have to do some diagnostics on that too, to figure out what the, what the cause is there. You can have um, positional vertigo that's actually really easily corrected through a set of head movements. And then there's other ones that other kinds of uh, vertigo and dizziness that require more long-term physical therapy and so forth. But yeah, there are definitely treatments. And so that's another um, specialty that we have here at the ASU clinic is um, testing for those kinds of vestibular disorders. And then I think this um, last question that came in is for both of you. So for individuals who live on reservations or in remote rural areas, is telemedicine possible for hearing testing or even maybe for some of the metrics that you were discussing, Dr. Liss, um, via perhaps an app or uh, telehealth through Zoom? Um, I can start out with the uh, with the app-based um, speech collection. Um, that I, that is one of the things that I think is is most valuable about um, being able to be remote and being able to use commonly available cell phones and things like that for um, both uh, uh, evaluation of speech, but also for telehealth. Um, and I'll let Kristen talk about the audiology, but from a speech language pathology standpoint, um, telehealth is very doable. And I think, um, you know, COVID uh, kind of forced us into uh, trying it out. And um, it's it's very promising. And I think that it will address the health disparities uh, on reservations and in rural areas and uh, where experts aren't available. Yeah, when people already have a pair of hearing aids, uh, most of the manufacturers now have apps and so forth that we can link into remotely and be able to adjust the person's hearing aids. Now, um, obviously that first, the first thing is a person getting tested and getting the hearing aids. Um, I saw a presentation at our last year's state convention by some audiologists from Indian Health Services. And that's one of our placements where we send our students from here. Um, and they have remote locations on the reservations around the state where they can go out and actually get people set up with you know the things they need and then they train technicians there where the patients can go to that site um and you know say like way up in the four corners or something and then an audiologist from down here in the valley can get into the computer and actually run the computer and the the, the they have technicians on site that are trained to you know get the hearing aid in the patient's ear and and so forth and then audiologists here in the valley can run the equipment and get them set up and programmed so I do know those services are available and getting better. Wonderful. Great. It looks like those are all the questions we had for today. So thank you again, everyone. Thank you for attending. Thank you to our wonderful presenters. Um, we do want to encourage you to follow the College of Health Solutions on social media so that you can learn more about other opportunities like this one. Our Health Talk series will continue next month with it's 420 somewhere, the highs and lows of medical marijuana. That talk will take place on Thursday, April 20th at noon Arizona time. Details and registration for ne next month's talks will be available at asuhealthtalks.com. That's asuhealthtalks.com. Thank you again and have a great rest of your day.